Acts chapter 5. We're going to reread what we read last week um, because some of you were not here for that. And I want to recap because I think it's a real strong word for our church where we're headed. But we're in verse 12 and we'll read on. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also the, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing the sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they had heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest with those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So, no, so one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. And when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to, be, to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. And after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they all agreed with him. When they had called the, for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Father, I pray today that you use your word to quicken us to do your will. Let us know it and let us do it well for your kingdom. As we finish out this year, Lord, let us finish strong with our hearts in the right place with you. In Jesus' name, amen. This whole chapter is laid on the question of whether we're going to fear men or fear God. These disciples we see were meeting at Solomon's porch. Solomon's porch was 
where thousands of people could congregate. They could come and sit. Uh, and the, the doors were huge. It took 20 men to open and shut these doors. They're massive, high doors that opened up into the temple. And Peter and, and the disciples met there with the congregation. Now, this is right after they had uh, been imprisoned for preaching in the temple just the chapter before. They said, let's go right back to the temple and have church. How many of you know it takes a lot to go to a church where you might get killed for going to church. Yeah. You might, it, it's scary. Uh, but they all met there. And I can't get a lot of people to come to church out of convenience. The sun has to be in the right position. Everything has to be perfect, right? But these guys were showing up at Solomon's porch preaching and having church right in the middle of everybody. And sure enough, here comes the Sadducees and pounce on them again and arrest them again. And it's going to kill them this time. How many of you know these people were dedicated to what they believed? How many of you know that the Lord wants our kind of dedication as well? Not one out of convenience, but one out of conviction. It seems that church was a priority to them. Some people have church under trees and by rivers, and they say, nature is my church. Nature wasn't these people's church. They went straight up to the temple and had church, and they had it house to house as well. They believed in being together. Fellowship was doctrine to them. You stick together. How many of you understand what I just said? That's New Testament Christianity. That is the model. That is the church little children were raised in at that time. We went to that church. And they may kill us for going to church, but we're going. It's like John Knox, who is the Presbyterian a uh, teacher, pastor, he preached with a sword at his side because he was scared of religious persecution. He had men with swords at the front of the church. You say, well, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Well, that's fine. But they, nonetheless, it was not America church. It was scary to be in that church. And the Bible says that a lot of the people esteemed them, but they dared not join to them. You don't want to be a part of that church. You could get killed for being that a part of that church. Um, they dared not join them because God was calling for a holiness in the church. We find the story of Ananias and Sapphira at the beginning of this chapter as well, where God uh, took the life of two people who were lying to the Holy Spirit they were living a double life. How many of you know you shouldn't come to church to hide? You should come to church to live honestly before the Lord. And yet we get here to this place where they dare not join them, but many people were added to the church that were believers. And Peter's shadow even, people were trying to get their family underneath that shadow to be healed. When I read about Peter's shadow, it started something on the inside of me a couple of weeks back, that we live under the shadow of God, under the shadow of His wings, but that we are to also cast the shadow of healing, a legacy over our families, over our children. A lot of us live in the shadow of what our parents have done. We live in the shadow of something somebody did to us. But how many of you want to leave a legacy of honor casting a shadow over your family that is of honor and not shame. You want to cast a shadow of healing over your family instead of what the young people are calling cast, throwing shade today, according to the Urban Dictionary. You throw shade on people, that means, you know, you blame them, basically, for whatever's going on in your life. It's a word of derision. But I want to be somebody that this church has a covering for many people that come in here from the heat. In the Old Testament, when it talks about the shadow of the Almighty, it's a place of refuge, a place of healing. These disciples didn't show up over one, on one day and just say, I'm mighty and strong. But they came under the shadow of Christ, the shadow of the cross. And I want to say today that I don't live under the shadow of even my parents. I live under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. He cast a shadow over my life of forgiveness and healing 
It's under his shadow I live today. And also, we've got some big shoes to fill. But do you know that Peter denied Jesus three times? He was the same guy that's standing up now saying, do whatever you want to do. I'm not going to stop preaching. He was growing up under the shadow of God. And I pray where we have failed in the past that we would get courage to grow and be strong, mature Christians. Have you ever seen some people that are Christians? Barely. And then you've got some Christians that are super Christians that you go, my goodness, that's a patriarch, that's a matriarch. You're intimidated being around them. They wear a Superman cape under their coat or whatever. I mean, they're mature, they're strong, they're, they're people that inspire. And I don't want to be this barely deal. I want to be somebody that grows up and is strong in the Lord. I want to cast a shadow for my family, not of shame and defeat, but one of victory, purpose, courage. I pray that my life inspires people to fight. I want my shadow at the end of the day to heal folks. People bring sick people into here. People that can't fend for themselves. And this is a place of covering where they receive healing. And, and it's not some dark cloud that they're living under for the rest of their life because somebody did something to them. How many of you want to live under the shadow of the Almighty and not under some dark cloud because somebody in your family did something? But how many of you want to be somebody also that casts your own shadow, being the hands and feet of Jesus? On this earth right now, they killed Christ and Christians sprung up everywhere. I want to be that person. These guys had no idea that 2,000 years later we'd be reading about them. They were fighting the powers that be. They were outnumbered. They were surrounded. But it's what they did right there that cast a shadow over the whole church. This is the model. This is the shadow by which we seek to live our lives today, the example. And I pray that we rejoice in his covering, but we also step up and say, Lord God, I want to fill those big shoes myself. So I want to talk about five things quickly. Five areas that we must fight in order to cast a shadow, a legacy of honor for our young people. How many of you know that our lives are very temporal? They come and go, but I want to make maximum impact, and I want my kids to remember something that inspires them to fight. And so there's four areas, there's four battlegrounds. And, and folks, when we go on the battleground of our faith, we've got to be all in. We've got to be all in. You watch these war movies where they're on the battle line, they're just screaming. Ah, that's where we got to be on these five areas, okay? Number one, we've got to fight for purity. We got to fight for purity. We see that God's not, ta he's not kidding in the first 11 verses of this chapter about purity. It's very serious to God. Many of you know purity is like a real big deal in the Bible. Yes. Sexual purity. Loving God more than our money, purity. Loving Jesus more than our sin, purity. God wants a pure church. He wants people that are, have singleness of heart toward Him. James 1, 13 through 16 says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. The idea here is uh, enticed is caught, ensnared uh, by a trap. It's like a piece of meat. Nobody sees the trap all around it that ensnares a man. And then it says, when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. A lot of people blame God for their sin. Well, this is where you put me. This is just how I am. But James says, no, it's your fallen nature. This is what you did. 
out of your own heart and you were drawn away by your own desires, you were ensnared, a, uh, a desire becomes a habit, something that ensnares your life, and then it's conceived and you become pregnant with it and then you give birth to sin and when that sin is full grown, it murders you. It becomes death. What's death? Death is something that you can't get back. Have you ever had somebody do something in your family or in your home and there was no going back? Why? Because somebody entertained that thing, got ensnared by that thing, and raised it. Come on, little death baby, killer, and feeds it and just loves it and raises it. Sin doesn't just happen, bro. It's not something you just did. It's something you cultivated. I mean, you grew that thing up. You raised it up. You tickled it as a part of your family. And then one day it turned on you and murdered the whole deal. And there was no going back. And you blame God. How could you do this to me? He said, man, you raised that thing. You went on a special diet when you're pregnant with it. You take, you took care of it. You tended it. The Bible says, don't you go blaming God for your stuff. It says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Right after that, it says this. And it says, of his own will begat he us, that we might be the first fruits of his creation. Meaning, if you're born again, God gave you the good stuff but you still have the remnants of sin in you, don't you go telling God that those desires are of Him. They're not. How many of you know people can justify their own sin all day long? How could it be wrong if I love this much? This is what real love is. I've never really been in love with that other person. Now I love. It doesn't matter what that you love. It matters what you love. And how many of you know you can love the wrong stuff? And you need to love the Lord your God more than you love anything else. It's not a matter of love, friend. It's a matter of the object of it. God says, man, before this thing goes to death, man, kill it. This Ananias and Sapphira thing, that was the tip of the spear. That didn't just happen. That was something going on for a long time, cultivated. And then death came, and you can't go back. How many of you have times in your life where you've done stuff that was real stupid and you knew that was it? You can't go back. Death. If you don't want that, live pure. If you've had enough deaths in your family, breakups, bust-ups, terrible stuff, live pure. The Bible says if we live in darkness and we say we have fellowship with one another, we're lying. We can't have fellowship with God if we're living in darkness. Man, we've got to walk in the light. Sin affects your relationship with everybody else. It affects your relationship with God. It just does. Stop doing it. But I desire it. It's so exciting. Man, pray to God. God, take it from me. Last week I told you that we've got to get the all of God in our life, but we also have to get the, what did I say? Do you remember? The ooh of God in our life. Where stuff that we used to be tempted with, now we just go, ooh. Right. Stuff everybody else is doing out there just makes your stomach turn. You're like, no, thank you. No, I've had, I've had enough of that. I don't want any more of that. I know some people, they have, uh, they have a story of, you know, just being alcoholics forever, and then one day the Lord delivered them from it, and they almost threw up when they were trying to do that stuff. Man, I pray the holy throw up get all over you. I really do. Or you just say, I am done with this stuff. I've had my face rubbed in it too much. I've had too much death happen because of that stuff. I'm going to stop sticking my finger in the plug. Because it doesn't feel good. Oh, you cuddly little murderous baby, you. Oh, look how he's growing, so beautiful. And then one day turn on you, murder you. You say, well, this is my way of life. This is the way I've always, yeah. And it's going to end poorly. Because death alters your, I'm sorry, sin alters your life. Alters your relationships. You say, John, 
You know, you have a beautiful wife, beautiful family, good for you. You're the lucky one, but I'm stuck over here single, and I've got to just... No, no, no. This is a battlefield for you. This is something that you need victory in, and you've got to fight. And I'm telling you right now, if you want a legacy of honor, you've got to fight for purity. F wage your own war, the Bible says. Do it for, for you. Secondly, power. The Bible says that there was power unleashed. Not only purity in the church, but power was unleashed in the church. And this is power to meet the needs of the church and meet the needs in society. This has to do with supernatural healing, but it also has to do in the chapter before with financially taking care of people who were in need. I don't want to do miracles so that we can call ourselves charismatics so that we can say we're not this other group. I could care less. I pray the power of God be unleashed on our church so that we can meet the needs of those who cannot fend for themselves and we can raise those up who cannot take care of themselves and we can show the mercy and the love of God. We don't do miracles. We don't do signs and wonders out of anything else but compassion. When we pray fervently, it's because we love people. We care about them. We don't want to see them in that state for the rest of their life. We're believing for breakthrough. We're standing for that in our lives. We're standing for our brothers and sisters. So when we pray, it's because we love people. The prayer of a righteous man, the Bible says, avails much. And we are believing God for healing in this house. And we're believing for God to show up. And we're believing for miracles, signs, and wonders. And spiritual needs to be met as well as people's lives are affected by the power of God. I want us to be all in when it comes to purity. And I want us to be all in when it comes to seeing the power of God in our church manifest. Amen. The power to do what? The power to get off your couch and go help somebody. The power to go feed homeless people. The power to help those that cannot help themselves. That's the power I'm praying for in this church. Thirdly, passion. These people were passionate. Normally when people go to hating on you, you back off and go sit down someplace and say, that was fun. These people, it caused them to be more zealous. They were passionate. They had a zeal. It says that the, the Sanhedrin, the powers that be, were filled with indignation. How many of you know we've got to be as filled with the Holy Spirit as the world is with indignation? We've got to be filled with the Spirit of God. A mature Christian stops going to worldly comforts when he's going through a hard time. He starts going to spiritual comforts. He goes to the Holy Spirit. He goes to prayer. He goes to the Word. He draws his strength from spiritual comfort over physical comfort. An immature Christian will find himself going to the bottle, going to something, going to sex, going to entertainment to get away, to escape. An immature Christian spends all their time thinking about their next vacation. I just can't wait to unplug and get out of here. A mature Christian says... My passion, my enjoyment is getting alone with God. That doesn't mean you can't take a vacation. But that's, you better pray while you're there. You better get with Jesus for a little while. Jesus took vacations for a few minutes, and then he'd swoop down and do some more miracles. It's okay to unplug. But I'm praying that we find our strength in spiritual comforts over physical comforts as a true Christian. You know, we're always going to be frustrated until we find godly contentment just in doing His will and letting the success of the thing be left to God. Amen. Always going to be frustrated if it's us trying to control the circumstances of our lives instead of just saying my meat is to do the will of God. And that holy zeal for God to grow in our hearts. These people got excited when things went wrong. That's spiritual maturity. They praised God at the wrong time, not at the right time. They, they sang songs at midnight. They enjoyed it. 
They love the fact that they got to be persecuted for God. These are far out dudes. You know, when you become a spiritual mature Christian, you become far out. You do, man. Everybody else is panicking and you're just filing your fingernails. I mean, there's no... You're steady like a rock, but, but man, when the heat gets turned up, it just makes you more zealous. These guys were filled with indignation. They lay hands on the apostles and they throw them in jail, but the angel of the Lord delivers them from the jail and sends them right back to the temple. You know, God, God's hand will not always deliver you, but it will always defend you. It won't always deliver you from your problem and say, now leave, get away from these guys. Don't ever go back. No, it's sending them right back. And a spiritually mature Christian, when they've been delivered from the hand of the enemy and sent right back, it's to make them more zealous for God. I don't want a bunch of people that are all old war horses that say, don't trouble me anymore. I did all my duty way back when. It says that they spoke the words of this life to the, to the people in the temple when they were released by the angel. They spoke the words of this life. How many of you know that the Bible is life? How many of you know Jesus is life? Yeah. Yeah. The words of this life. But you know, it's not just life. It's for life. You have to do it the whole of your life. There is no retirement from being a Christian. It's forever. And there needs to be a passion in us a zeal in us that says today is day one and I'm going to become even more obnoxious for Jesus and I'm just going to go right back and God didn't deliver me so I could get off course and go be somewhere where it's peaceful. God sent him right back in the fray. He doesn't always deliver us from stuff. Sometimes he sends us right back into it. But he defends us, doesn't he? He defends us. He fights for us. Sometimes right in the middle of something we want it out of. Fourthly, not only passion, making God our refuge, saying he is our life. And we're going to do this for life, but fourthly with that, persistence. Persistence. And what is persistence? To me, persistence is the last thing that is said in this chapter, it says, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, and they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Persistence, I believe, is a commitment to taking all the shame of your past and saying it is on the payroll of the glory of God. It is on the payroll of me getting some honor for a legacy that is coming. It is not giving up to where even the shame, the stuff that has caused you shame, you say, that's going to work together for the good of what God's about to do in my life. That is persistence. It is not, I did everything for God and look where it ended, shamefully. People treated me terribly. The end, no. Persistence says it doesn't stop there. I'm taking all the shame, I'm taking all the, the hits, and I'm saying, look, these men were not well armed. They didn't have anything to fight or defend themselves with. What was their arsenal? What were their weapons? I say their weapons were their own wounds. Their weapons were their own stripes. They are armed with their own beatings. And they said, I'm not giving up. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord. Well, you take a man or a woman that has been, the life has tried to pound them into the dirt and they get back up and they say, all of that is on the payroll of all that God's about to do in my life. I am turning my shame into honor. Even my low times are going to complement what God is about to do. 
People will be able to relate to me. They'll know right where I'm at. But God's not done with me. And I'm not done with this thing until I am counted worthy to suffer shame for him. See, Ryan, man, all the stuff in your past, dude, because you got back up and you are committed to the glory of God and you love the glory of God, all of that is on the payroll of what's about to come to your life. That is persistence. Turning shame into honor. How many of you want a legacy of honor? Don't quit. Everything the enemies try to do to blow you up your life, even the stuff you brought upon yourself, don't let it shame you into the ground. Say, Lord, I'm counted worthy to have some shame. And what is shame? Shame is when the devil has beat you up, persecuted you, beat you down through people, through life, whatever, and it makes you embarrassed, and it makes you feel less than, and it makes you feel vulnerable. How many of you remember the time the devil really tried to embarrass you? And you felt it. I feel ashamed. These guys, they weren't made of steel. They literally felt shame. They felt it. They were ashamed. They were made to feel it. They're human beings. But at the end of the day, they said, boy, even that's on the payroll of what God is up to in my life. How many of you won't give up? on your testimony. Your testimony includes all that junk. Come on, you guys. Amen? You say, well, God can only work with the good. No, God's going to work it all together for the good. Put it all into the story of how terrible you were, of how carnal you were, of how everything, but then God still, you're under his shadow, and you just kept growing and growing and growing, and God wouldn't give up on you and look at you now. And you ain't where you're going to be. You say, I'm not perfect. Yeah, but press on. Yeah. Keep pressing. Don't give up on the high calling of God on your life. Your mandate is to take your shame and turn it into honor. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock. Those deaths may have happened. My God is still alive. And because he's still alive, I'm not done. We must persist, brothers and sisters. We must persevere until we leave a legacy of honor for our children. Don't give up on your testimony. Fifthly, providence. We see that the Lord delivered them. He raised up a guy that was kind of friendly but he was not a believer, Gamaliel, and he's very popular, and he was a Pharisee, and so everybody loved him, and his voice carried a lot of weight. These guys were going to murder all the apostles, and the end of the book of Acts was about to happen in chapter 5. But this guy rose up, and how many of you know God can influence the ungodly as well as the godly? He can raise up somebody who's not even a Christian to be an instrument to preserve the church. How many of you know God can use anybody? And he raises up providentially Gamaliel. He sends an angel, but then he raises up a heathen, a religious one. And he might not have been far from the kingdom of God. I don't know. Doesn't say. But he stands up and he defends the church. He says, you know, if this is of God, y'all don't want to fight against him because whatever's of God will prevail. How many of you know whatever's of God will prevail? Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we've got to trust in the providence of God in this whole thing, that he is going to work miracles on behalf of our church, on behalf of our lives, on behalf of our families. Breakthrough's coming. And I'm banking the whole deal on breakthrough coming. As I live my life in such a way at times that swims up string that's not popular. But what's this whole chapter about? It's about whether you're going to quit or not. And if you quit, you will submit to the fear of man. If you quit, you are bowing your knees 
to a godless religion. You'll have a little bit of morality, but you will have no relationship with the living God. And you will bow your knee to whatever man says or does. And I'll go a little further and I'm done. I know we all have wives, men, most of us. But there's only one wife mentioned in this chapter. Her name was Sapphira. And the apostles' wives are not mentioned here. I don't want any man so domesticated in this church that you don't go to war for Jesus. Well, let me get, let me see what we, we got going before I ever make a decision for Christ. No, when you go to war, you leave it all out on the battlefield. And brothers and sisters, we got to put it all out on the battlefield for our purity, for our power, for our passion, for our persistence in putting God first and letting him add everything else to us. I don't want to be so domesticated that I'm dainty for Christ. And if I ever get any pushback, I've got to go find a couch to wet my head because I'm delicate. I'm God's flower. No, I'm not. Lord's girt about with truth, breastplate of righteousness, feet shot. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I have fought a good fight of faith. This is a battle. We are called to war. And if you want any kind of life, you've got to get out there, man of God, and fight for what is yours and wage your own warfare. And not sit around. So, and I love decorating in our houses. And I love, but there's something on the inside of me that says if this stuff is supposed to be peaceful, I got to go to war. I'm not going to be like David, man, who didn't go to war and just hanging out at the house. Man, there needs to be a fight on the inside of this church. This cannot be some country club where we just get together and sing hallelujah and get our comfort on and, 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 and go home and be comfortable. God's calling us out of our comfort zones. He's saying, you know what, purity is going to cost you something. It is a battle. It is not fun. It's not easy. You've got to embrace the pain before you get the peace. You want power, you're going to have to put yourself out there and, 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 and put yourself out there on the limb for God. You're going to prophesy, you better put yourself out there. You're going to get, see people get healed, you've got to put yourself out there. You want to uh, see people delivered, you're going to have to put yourself out there. You want to see people's lives changed, man, it's going to cost you something out of your pocket. Man, I want a passionate relationship with God. I want to live for the things that are eternal, and I'm not fighting for this temporal little deal of mine. I am living for legacy that goes on beyond us, and it's going to take warriors and champions and people that are not titty babies for Jesus in Jesus' name. I'm just telling you. It's going to, it's going to take some people that are not settling under the shadow of their parents and saying, you know what, that's just the way it went. No, no, no. We are going to live for God and we are going to finish strong and we are going to turn every bit of the shame of our past into honor. Man, stick up for yourself. Love yourself enough in God to stick up for the heart he gave you and Proverbs 24, 6, by sound counsel, you will wage your own war. You've got your own war to fight and win. Where would our nation be without the military to defend it? Men and women that went out there, World War II, Vietnam, man, were they sitting there going, now how does this affect me? What, what's going to happen to me if I... Get out there with guns. Man, those people put it all out there so that they could come home one day to peace. And brothers and sisters, we have to do the same. Listen, this has to be priority all in if we want to see this in our homes. And we've got to trust in the Lord that he's going to fight for us as we position ourselves to honor him.
And all the while, I must say, we are under the shadow of his forgiveness and the repentance he gives. It says he gave forgiveness and repentance. And how many of you know God has delivered us and is delivering us, but if it wasn't for his forgiveness, he could really pick at us, couldn't he? How many of you are thankful that you're under the shadow of his healing, forgiveness, and he is working repentance in our lives, and he's our daddy? How many of you are thankful that forgiveness and repentance are given? Amen? Amen? And he's working in us, and he's our dad, and he's undergirding us, and I'm under his shadow today, and I act like it's my deal. It's really his. I'm very thankful for him. But he steps back every so often and sees his handiwork, and he says, I'm testing you. Let's see how you're going to do with this devil right here. Now fight, because I ain't going to raise some spoiled kid. I'm looking for a warrior who will fight and play for keeps and is all in with purity. Come on, you guys. We need purity in the house of God. I'm tired of this stuff sneaking up on the church, blowing a hole out of the side of it because somebody raised a murderer. Is this all right today? Y'all enjoying this? Is helping anybody else besides me? <laughs> Glory to God. Praise the Lord. I want His purity. I want, and then power will be released. I want the passion of God in our life. I want to be more zealous for Him than the world is hating on us. Remember when the devil came in hating on you so bad? I want you to love God more than He hated on you. Andy, I want us to go for the gold, man, when it comes to honoring God with our life and taking every beating we've ever had and say, isn't that wonderful that we were worthy to suffer shame for Jesus? Most people, when they suffer shame, they go, oh, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. Had a f that was fun. I'm gone now. I can't believe God hurt my feelings like that. I can't believe he allowed me to ever be embarrassed. We fight, Andy, we fight so deeply over the praise of men. It's an unspoken thing, but it's true. We want to look good in front of people. And it's so deep inside of us. But God, I pray that we would live for the praise of God over the praise of men. And that we wouldn't quit because quitting means kneeling before the fear of God. Of men. What else could happen if we stick with God? It's been such a rough year. It has been a rough year. It's been a rough year. And bring it. And bring it. Oh God, that our men wouldn't be soft. and so domesticated and fit God in. How are you ever going to win if you don't go to battle? Bunch of dainty Ananias is running around. No more. Man, spearhead this thing. Break through. You cast a shadow over your family, man of God. Cast it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Let's stand up this morning. Elijah, you be a man of God, bro. You cast a shadow, bro. You're mighty in God. Vincent, man, cast your own shadow. Wage your own war. Stand under the shadow of Almighty God when it comes to your identity, man. Be like me. How many of you need God to put the ooh in the place of temptation? How many of you need him just to put his hand on you today? And you say ooh about stuff you've been tempted with. Let me see your hand. You say I need the ooh of God put in my life. I just say ooh, yucky, nasty. Come on, anybody say, I'm struggling with sin. I need the ooh of God as well as the awe of God in my life.
How many of you today say, I need to see the power of God at work in my life. I want to be used for his power to meet the needs of others this year. I don't want to be tired. I don't want to backpedal. I don't want to be sidelined. I want to be used by God. I want to see his power at work in my life. How many of you don't want to lose your first love and just become a religious, uh, godless person? But you want a relationship with God and you want to run to him more than you do to anything else for your comfort. How many of you need God in your life? Let me see your hand today. You say, I'm not going to forsake my comfort in the Lord. Let me see your hand today. You say, John, I'm going to run to God. That's going to be my prayer life. You know how people pray? They get persecuted real bad and they need God to take care of them. They need to be weak somewhere, so they need to go to be with God.